Hmm. We're streaming. We're on. Yay. Hmm. Oh, we lost people already. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> we're streaming. We're on. Yay. Oh wait, that's not supposed to happen. It's supposed to go the other way. Yeah, let's give it a minute. Let's get these people back. <laughs> they heard that International Women in Engineering Day is tomorrow. Today, today in some places. Oh, oh that's right. Today yeah. in other parts of the world. So I'm, I'm really disappointed in myself that I didn't know about it. But now that we do know that tomorrow is International Women in Engineering Day, are you, you going to do anything? <laughs> I'm going to have to come up with something. Um, for me, though, it probably involves like building something out of Legos with my son. Right. But maybe I'll take pictures of it and post it, right? Like, <laughs> this is how it all started back in the day. Did you start with Legos? I, I love Legos and I don't, my mom used to tell a story about me building, you know, like a big like camper van with a family and this was before the kits and all that, right? Um, yeah, and so, yeah, I guess it kind of did start with Legos. I never really had Legos. I just had my computer. And then when I got a little bit older, my friend, my best friend grew out of her Legos. She was over it. And she gave it all to me. And I spent maybe the next two years of my life just building and building and building. <laughs> <laughs> How fun. See, there weren't computers at home when I started. So we, the, we got a little bit of a generational difference. <laughs> yeah, that too. But also, even at that age, it, they, they were hard to come by. I think my mom really, really just worked very hard to make sure that we had that. Went out of her way to do it. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. All right, we got 40, so I'm going to go ahead and open. Let's do it. Okay, so um, welcome, you guys, 40 people listening. My name is Michelle Gill. I'm the Vice President of Engineering for Linux Academy. Uh, I'm responsible for all of our applications and services under the Linux Academy roof, um, and I'm a woman in this field. So kind of what I was just saying, I started really young, around six to eight years old. Um, I grew up in a really small town with uh, not a lot of connections to anything. And my mom worked all the time. She had two or three jobs at any point. Um, and she really made it a point to make sure that I did have access to computers and electronics and devices. Um, and so I spent a lot of time doing that on my own. I didn't have a lot of guidance. I taught myself a lot of things and I used that as kind of something that was fun, that I didn't really consider to be real work or something that I would do as a career. Um, so I'm really excited to be hosting this webinar, especially since tomorrow is International Women in Engineering Day. And I think it's gonna be really great moving forward and trying to address some of the challenges of women in the tech industry. So I have with me Sylvia Briscoe. I'll let her introduce herself for you. Go ahead, Sylvia. Thanks, Michelle. I thought I had uh, another slide for you, but the first one is about me. So um, my name is Sylvia Briscoe and I'm a, a systems engineer right now at F5 Networks. And I thought I'd take a little bit of time to define what that is. I feel like systems engineer, as long as I've had this title seems kind of vague, like what, what does that mean? Um, so what that means, a lot of people also call it a sales engineer or pre-sales engineer. Um, and I know I just use the word sales and engineer all in the same title, uh, but I work with a lot of uh, the, the world's largest equipment manufacturers. So everybody that's making gear for telecommunications um, needs people to define what that product is and how it works and how it would work in some of the really large service provider environments. So I spend a lot of time positioning new feature sets, right, for both hardware and software um, and making those work in new environments within large organizations. So that's 
that's my job. Another big part of my job is also to keep all of the actual salespeople, the account managers in check <laughs> and just make sure that they're telling the truth about all the features and functionality. Not that they would lie on purpose, but they might uh, exaggerate a little bit. But then if I come in behind them um, and have to make the product work, then that's sort of when, when the rubber hits the road. So that all has to work really nicely together. So how did I get into this career? I get this question a lot. Um, and I do believe part of the reason I get the question is because I'm female. So people are kind of curious, like, you know, do you really like this? How did you get started? And my road was pretty straight. So compared to Michelle, who kind of started very young and uh, was exposed to, to a lot of computing, um, I learned most of it through, through school. So I majored in computer information systems from the University of Texas at El Paso. Um, El Paso is right on the border between Mexico and the U.S. And I know there's a lot of controversy about that area right now, which is deeply unfortunate. I feel bad about it. Um, but it's, that school has been there a long time. There's a big army base there, and it used to be called Texas Western. And we have um, a lot of famous graduates, probably like a lot of other schools, but people like Sandra Day O'Connor, who was a Supreme Court justice, graduated from there. And then there was this really cool movie called Glory Road that talked about like the first all African-American starting lineup. Um, and it was about trying to place talent, right? Talent uh, into view above race. So UTEP has kind of a, an interesting and varied background, kind of the beginning of the melting pot. So uh, that was where I studied. And then I started practicing. I got a couple of internships, both with Nortel and Jet Propulsion Labs. And JPL was kind of what propelled my whole career, pun intended, because I got hired there to install a three-story network. Um, so, I'm sorry, a network into a three-story building. <laughs> and this is a picture of me back in those days with some of the other guys that were um, guys and women, <laughs> guys and gals that were uh, interning with me at JPL. And so putting in this infrastructure into uh, a building where honestly what I did to figure out what I was supposed to do, right? They hired me, they're like, go ahead and install this network. And I was like, great, I have no idea what that means. I have no idea what I need to do. Um, I went to the library, I went to the campus library. I checked out some books on networking. Um, I happened to grab kind of the biggest books that I saw because I thought I could learn the most from those. And they were on token ring. So token ring networking, which is what you do with big giant mainframes totally off course. Um, I was <laughs> saved by a guy who was actually doing infrastructure uh, cabling for this brand new thing called Ethernet. So he was putting an Ethernet network into the campus and he said, uh, maybe this is what you need. And I said, absolutely, <laughs> that's what we need. So I went off and bought NIC cards for the computers there, right? Network interface cards and uh, put them into all the computers and got everything wired up and everything was great and wonderful and good to go. Uh, when I left, my internship, about two weeks later, everybody moved out of that building. So that was a little bit of a bummer, but um, that launched me or that sort of labeled me as a network engineer. And that led to my first job at Texas Instruments um, as a wide area network engineer. And this is my group from, from back then. I found a couple of pictures. And this is me uh, and my husband and my little boy, and we all live in Denver. Uh, and we're enjoying all the 300 plus days of, of sunshine here. <laughs> so what else are we going to be talking about? We kind of did our intros and this is the agenda for uh, the talk today. First, changing perspectives. Um, I have changed my mind a couple of times about what it means to work in the industry. Um, and I kind of want to walk you through that because I feel like, um, like it is controversial. And then what's it like to be a woman in tech, kind of the good, the bad, and the ugly. So I will give you a warning when we're getting into some of the probably not so fun stuff. Um, and then how, why would women want to be in tech? It's an awesome career. It's a lot of fun. We'll talk about that for a bit. And how do we move forward? What can we do? How can we bring more women into technology? It's, we really need to. There's very, very few. So my evolving views. Um, about women in tech, I have not always thought that we need more women in the industry. And the reason why is because I didn't really think there was a, a, a true barrier to entry. I, I kind of haphazardly chose these years, right? 2003 and 2016. 
Um, 2003, I was in my early 30s. I've had this career, right? I was like fully immersed in everything that I was doing. And I felt like anybody could do this. Um, certainly any female, right? We're talking late 90s, early 2000s. Why wouldn't women just study um, computer science? Why wouldn't they just get into the field? Um, I didn't really see that there was, there was any problem. Fast forward though, or slowly forward um, into 2016, now I'm in my mid, uh, mid 40s, and I've noticed nothing has changed. There's not more women coming in. And what does make it different? What does make it difficult? So what I didn't realize in 2003 was that I did come from a family full of tech graduates. Um, I have three sisters, right? So there were four of us, all of us majored in either CIS or computer science. And we both, uh, we all pursued careers in technology. So I had my own uh, infrastructure, right? I had my own, my own little posse <laughs> to say, hey, you're doing the right thing. And then I was surrounded by these very strong female role models, including my mom. So my mom was a nurse. Um, she always said she would have been an engineer if they would have let her, but her parents didn't. They wanted her to go to a boarding school and study nursing, um, which was a thing to do back then. Uh, and then she studied her career twice, right? So once uh, as a once uh, in her home country of Mexico in Spanish, and then the second time in English in the U.S. So she started all over when she was 38, and then finished again when she was 51. So, so there, actually right here, I'm sorry, Sylvia, if I could no, just, go ahead. This, this is something that I really want to bring up because um, your differences with me are really important to note because you did come from a family of engineers and I didn't. And I think that that is a really great combination for this webinar because from my perspective, I came in thinking I don't belong here. And you kind of came in thinking, I know I belong here. Why don't you think I belong here? And I think that those two things are really the majority of what's going on today. And they're very valid problems because one of them requires women to change and the other one requires our culture to change, the whole culture and the whole industry to change. Um, so I just wanted to add that because I think that that first step is just that awareness. That is such a super, super great point. Like I, since I always did belong, I never saw a problem. So it's sort of looking back that I can start to see it. And the fact that you say that you felt like you didn't belong, like that makes me pause, right? Like, oh my gosh, why would a woman feel like that? <laughs> it's hard to believe. And I think either people are gonna be like you or they're gonna be like me. And it's, it's hard for us to understand the other side of the coin. I agree, I agree. We need to talk about all these things. This is great. Um, so in addition to all of that, I was also purposely recruited as a female, right? People went off to Utah right in the middle of the desert and said, hey, uh, this is a good engineering school. You guys probably have uh, minority candidates that, that will work with us. And of course, ended up at JPL and some really great organizations after that. And then finally, um, career sacrifices. I actually had to quit the job that I was in to finally make time to start a family. And I didn't start a family until very much later. Um, I was over 40 when my son was born. So it, it wasn't just happening. There was definitely something different um, about having this career. So all the things that I had learned for sure by 2016, life happens, right? You've got all kinds of events, good and bad, marriages, illnesses, whether your own or somebody that you love, taking care of your parents, um, so many things which make the social aspects of work a lot more important. Um, I grew up kind of thinking, you know, work above all else, study above all else, everything has to be disciplined, uh, but you get into some of these things and all of a sudden you realize it's different being, being a woman and, and it's nice to have the support of other women being around. Um, I had, I wanted to put this bullet point up here. And yet when I put it up here, I'm like, is this kind of silly? Like, do I have to tell a group of adults <laughs> that being a woman is different than being a man? Um, and then I was listening to Sheryl Sandberg yesterday, just kind of to, to hear, rehear, because I, I did read the book Lena and I have listened to her TED talk a couple of times and, and she's great. And, and she said something that really hit home for me, which she said, she was like, I was embarrassed to bring attention to the fact that I was female. 
And I was like, oh my gosh, that's it. That's what it is. Like, I, I don't want to make it known. <laughs> and I laugh when I say it because it's ridiculous, right? You're like, I don't want to bring attention to the fact that I'm female, even though everybody can plainly see it. Um, I feel like that's kind of a leftover from um, the huge feminist movements. And I'm not saying feminist is bad, but I'm saying the, the movements kind of in the 60s and the 70s where everything was supposed to be equal. And I think we're kind of still stuck a little bit on the whole equal and being the same. Um, it, it did, and so let me, let me give you a story because I thought this was actually super funny and probably uh, applicable. Women were not allowed to run in marathons until the 1970s. Like literally you couldn't join a marathon because you were female. So sometime in the eighties, there was an official statement put out um, and, then, and then they were allowed. But sometimes in the eighties, there was an official statement put out uh, to say that it was okay for women to run 26.2 miles. Like they had to be allowed <laughs> to do this. And I'm like, okay, people out in the country probably knew this a long time ago, but now in order to join like industrial society, um, they had to be allowed. And then they finally started an Olympic marathon at about 1984. And I feel like that's kind of what we're fighting for is just kind of these rights to be accepted the way that we are, right? Like we just want to shot at the starting line. We know we can do this. Um, let's not make it a weird thing. Let's just let everybody in at the same time. Um, a couple of things had to had to be accounted for when women started running marathons. Um, the very first jogging bra ever made apparently was made from two jock straps. So <laughs> that's an interesting way to kind of get what you need, right? Or some distinctions that you have to make. Um, and also jogging strollers. Like somebody had to come up with jogging strollers and say, hey, these would be really cool to help women run. So I'm not sure what the equivalent of like a jogging stroller is for technology, but I will tell you, um, it takes a lot of time, right, to, to work in tech. Um, it takes a lot of learning, um, formal and, and informal training. Um, and I feel like maybe there's some changes that we need to make, um, not only for women, but also for men that face a lot of, of pressure um, in their lives and, and can still contribute to this field hugely. It's kind of, it's kind of neat though, right? Because we're in a field that can make life a lot easier for everybody. Mm -hmm. So tech is, is really intimidating. It can be really intimidating when you don't fit into the culture. And I'm going to talk about that more as we go. And the solution is building community, right? Building community, building friendships, getting to know people. I've had a super great time getting to know Michelle during, during this process and putting this seminar together. So this is what I'm talking about. And I, I love this distinction, fitting in versus belonging. So fitting in is changing yourself to look like and act like the group so that you can fit into it. And belonging is just being who you are and getting accepted right away. And just saying, hey, come as you are, be part of the group, you don't need to change. <laughs> And this is kind of what I felt like at the beginning of my career, right? Like I had to dress like the guys and I did. I adopted the polo shirt and the khaki pants and uh, <laughs> tried to fit in despite the fact that I wasn't fooling anybody. And I put a mandatory cat picture in here because I think this one helps me to remember the difference, right? Just because you fit doesn't mean that you belong. You can contort yourself. You can do lots of different things to be part of the group. Um, but hopefully you can just belong and be accepted the way that you are. So what is it like to be a woman in tech? Um, I had 23 years of experience. So like I said, I feel like I have a pretty, ra pretty wide range of what that can look like and look like in different organizations. And I distilled it a bit here. Um, some of it's not so great. So like I said, we'll kind of go through that and then we'll talk about, hey, how do we change it? How do we make it better? So this is where we are right now in terms of numbers, or at least this is where the census says we are, which is to say a lot more women are in the workforce overall. So we've gone from like a 38% of the workforce overall to actually being 47%, pretty close to 50 of the entire workforce. But when it comes to IT occupations, the numbers are down. And this is not only developers and engineers, but this is um, product managers and anybody else that might work within information technology. And you'll see um, that that curve has a has a downward trend, especially since since the 90s. And 
we were talking about this, Michelle. We think that this number is kind of high, isn't it? Like as a percentage overall. Yeah, I, I think that this number is definitely very high. So one of the things that I like to do every year that I'm just waiting for it to come out is the Stack Overflow Developer Survey. And the reason that I'm watching that survey is to see if the women percentage has increased or decreased. So right now for just development, we're sitting at 6%, um, just developers. So if we want to factor in all IT occupations, I'm not totally sure that 25% is um, accurate. I think that's too high of a number. So last year, um, I did a lot of hiring. Um, I personally reviewed 80 code tests from developers. Um, so that doesn't count the code tests that other members in my department have reviewed. And only one of those were from a female. And that's out of something mm -hmm. like 1,000 resumes that we reviewed last year. So in total, if you want to count all the resumes and all the code tests, three of those were from females. I, I, I also find that like completely unbelievable, like especially with all, all the movement that we have to push women towards development. Like, wow, that's really amazing and eye opening. Right. This is you're you're in Dallas. This is a hub of <laughs> of technology. You're not out somewhere remote. Right. Right, exactly. So, and that's kind of where I'm coming from on that 25% all occupations across the entire um, United States. Is this the United States? Yeah, I think it <laughs> Right. Clearly, we're not talking the world because I, I don't think other countries are quite having the same issues. But um, yeah, that, that's astonishing. So 6% spread out across all the states. That's even lower. Right? Yeah. That's a really low percentage. And that's kind of an interesting point too. And I, I don't have a lot of stats on what international numbers look like versus the numbers in the US, but that that would definitely be something to, to look into, um, right. hopefully as a way to improve our numbers. So, so having said that, right, you kind of see where we're at. And this is, this is why this is what it feels like to be a woman in tech. Um, so it feels like there's very, very, very few of us in the field. Um, and it feels like we're trying to join a group that is all headed in the same direction, working on the same things, um, but that we stand out. Um, once again, everybody can tell that, that you're a woman. Um, and so that leads to uh, a little bit of, of negative stereotyping or just, or maybe just confusion. Um, so, so what does that look like? So the model for understanding redfish, redfish are the exception. No, we got a couple of women, eh, whatever. Uh, redfish infiltrated the system, right? Let's marginalize them. Well, they'll be off to the side there. Redfish are the best. Let's cherish them. They're great. They're awesome. Um, I love these guys, by the way, <laughs> the ones who come in and just give you credit and they're like, hey, you made it. You're here. You're part of the group. Thank goodness you're here. Redfish, eh, they're temporary. We can just ignore them. They're going to go away. The harsh reality about this point is that it's true. A lot of women leave the industry within five years, and I believe the break point is 12 years. So 12 years into a career, a woman will just, a woman will just abandon that career. And that's sad. And then last, this is definitely not my favorite, but uh, with some, some of that training that we take um, sometimes backfires. Redfish are trouble. Uh, maybe hiring a woman's going to be an HR problem. No, we, we don't want them around. So the bottom line is that there's no real cohesive model for integration. Um, and this is something that should change and it could change just, just by adding more redfish, just by having more women around and, uh, not having it be something strange or odd in the environment. So what does not fitting in look like or feel like? Um, no one recognizes you as part of the group, right? This can't be the engineer. Um, no, the technical resource, you know, right away, the eyes go to the man, not the woman. You make an easy target, though. You're really easy to spot. <laughs> so people may know your name, and uh, they might also be wondering, like, hey, does she have permission to come into this computer room? Like, who is she? What's she doing here? constantly have to prove that you fit, that you belong, right? So are you sure you, you know, you have to constantly prove to yourself 
hey, I'm doing the same thing that everybody's doing. I'm just as competent as everybody else. We're working all the same projects and can lead to a little bit of imposter syndrome if you constantly get questioned on it. Also, um, and I don't think these people do it on purpose, but they're kind of wondering, are you, are you in the right place? Is this really where you want to be? Maybe there's something else that you could be doing where you could be a little bit more, more comfortable. <laughs> this one is, is funny if it wasn't funny, right? If I didn't feel like this was actually having an impact uh, within our society. There's no such thing as a logical woman. Isn't that just an oxymoron? I don't feel like women are the only ones that feel this way. I feel like any of these things could apply to any minority, but I do feel that women suffer greatly um, from especially uh, the bad meme about women not being able to be logical. So with all due apologies to Mrs. Clinton, I think she makes a good kind of poster for, for this next slide, which is what, is what is the meme out there? Like, what do we think about these serious logical women? They have super strong opinions, they have piercing eyes, they're ready to bite someone's head off at any moment, pretty dogged and determined, and single-minded. And I do think these last two bullet points are very important. Like you do have to be dogged and determined. You do have to be single-minded in what you're doing in order to be able to move forward. Um, but outspoken women can be viewed um, as really bossy and aggressive. And this is what um, Sheryl Sandberg said about women overall in leadership positions, right? And this is something that she's working hard um, for people to change. Like, we're not bossy, we're just doing a job. Um, and I feel like in tech, there's, there's a lot of the same uh, ideas, the same, uh, I don't wanna call it prejudice, but, but it is sort of just this negative meme. So let's look at the positive side. Like I've talked about some of the bad things, some of kind of the isolation. So why would you wanna be a woman in tech? Cause it's awesome. <laughs> you have a stable, you're in a stable and emerging career, right? There's a lot of career growth. There's a lot of need for people to perform technical jobs across many, many industries. Um, there's financial freedom. It's a good paying career. Um, there are flexible work schedules, which are great uh, for both men and women. So if you're a night owl, you can program well into the night. If you like to wake up really early, you can do that. And you can kind of plan your schedule um, around work and turn in work remotely from a lot of different places as well. So it's a good career. You get to work on a lot of fun problems. It's definitely needed. And it's great for both men and women. So how do we move forward? Like, how do we get more women in this industry? We've tried several things before and they haven't really been working. Um, here's my idea and Linux Academy can help a lot with this idea. Um, inclusion, right? Um, active recruitment, community involvement with technical training. Because we're constantly having to learn and retooling, I would say every three years and uh, that speed is going up higher and higher. So that means we used to have to retool like every five years. Now it's every three years, maybe soon it'll be every two years. You cannot stop learning in this environment. And this is a great time to bring in new people, right? So you can encourage and uplift the women around you by participating in a lot of local groups and learning what's the greatest, what's the latest thing. Is it Ansible? Is it Docker? Is it, um, what's the new form of uh, DevOps methodology with continuous improvement, continuous, in I'm sorry, continuous integration and continuous delivery. Let's talk about that. Let's talk about the technologies. Let's answer all the questions and let's bring in some women. So to that extent, some of the pictures that you see down here are from some of the events that uh, I've participated in. Um, oh, kind of went a little bit out of order, but let me talk about that. So, so why do we want to bring women into the field overall? Here's some good statistics and I feel like people are compiling more and more of these statistics Companies with at least one woman director have a better share price, right? So better share price performance um, over the last six years compared to the number of companies without any women. Workforce innovation, huge thing. Once you bring in a non-trivial amount of women, meaning 20% or more into a management position, then innovation starts increasing. 
And then companies in the top 25% for gender diversity are also 15% more likely to have better financial returns. So all really good numbers that show that uh, diversity and inclusion of women does help the bottom line. So creating a new theme for the logical woman. Um, <laughs> these are kind of some things that I came up with. Feel free to bring in your own. I would love to know what people think. And when I think about this too, like the new meme, like if I had a, a daughter and a lot of people do, right? You have a, a daughter who is awesome at programming and really likes, um, potentially could be a really good engineer you don't want a negative theme associated with her. You want her to have to be thought of as um, a very productive member of society and probably a happy person who uh, can do a lot of good things for the community. So, so you want smart, smart and driven and logical women to, to have a good meme around them. Um, so they're financially sound, right? They can bring in good income, they can manage money, um, they can help solve practical problems and raise smart kids. So why do they raise smart kids? Because they're good role models, they're good mentors. I did a little bit of research on this and found that the tipping point for a new meme is at 10% of the population. So, um, and this is from Rensselaer Polytech University. They say that once you can get the 10% of the population to change perspective, that's kind of the point where it all catches fire and everybody else can change their mind as well. So uh, just in case you guys are looking for a target, We'll come up with a new meme and then try to get 10% of the population to, to catch on to that new meme. I think women actually just took over more than 50% of the workforce too. So this should be easy. <laughs> we got 50%. All we need is 10% of, yeah, the whole thing, right? So <laughs> it should be easy. Um, other things that I really love, women's conferences. Man, this is so good because now you're not the minority <laughs> and you're just immersed in a group of women. And this particular one that you see at the bottom was a Lady Coders conference. And this was a panel of women who have a lot of longevity in the industry. Um, and everybody was just talking about kind of what they've been doing and their accomplishments. And it was great. It was good to not stick out and not have people question you three times on what you're doing. Um, and then to listen to these wonderful achievements um, from a lot of people with high voices and, and long hair. <laughs> so local community, um, going back to what I was talking about in, in learning in continuously having to learn in a, a new environment, I feel like a good place to belong instead of fit in is your local community. So when you show up to a lot of these meetup events or to training classes, um, you can just come as you are, right? Dress casual, uh, bring your food, show up and start learning some tech. I'm on the board of directors for Software Freedom School and uh, full disclosure here, we didn't start off as a women's organization. I was like the only woman when, well, that's not true. There's been other women that have come through the school, um, but I've loved them so much that I've stuck with them. Um, and now we're doing a lot of proactive outreach to uh, women's groups, like equally. Um, and we also, uh, we also grow alliances with other groups, which then hopefully will lead to other groups <laughs> that also reach out to women's groups. <clears throat> so we've done a lot of things with women who code. Um, we have an alliance with IT for non-traditional learners. We put together classes on everything that we deem is new and uh, needed for technology today. Oop. I forgot that was my last slide. Hold on, hold on. <laughs> <laughs> too soon, too soon. And this is how I contribute to tech, to uh, bringing women into tech today, which is create classes, use organizations like Linux Academies, Linux Academy, and uh, help help the women come in right in the fr in a friendly environment. So that just means sometimes that just means like standing up and shaking hands and asking, what do you want to do with your career? Where are you at now? Where are you going? Um, how can we help connect you with somebody else who does the same thing that you want to do? And I think, and I've seen some changes. I've actually seen a lot of changes within these groups and the local women that come and attend. Some, some of them are just trying it on for size. They're like, 
I kind of know there's this IT thing, but I'm not so sure um, what it's all about. Um, and then they come to like, you know, five different classes over the course of about three months. And then you can see them getting more excited and bringing in better laptops <laughs> and really getting hands on. Um, and then it's kind of amazing how easy they can make it look. So I highly encourage everybody else to kind of reach out to their local community, um, get involved. and not only for the girls, but also for the women who may want to retool or may want to come back to the industry. Let's, let's welcome them back. Welcome them back. Thank you. That's all I have, Michelle. All right. Well, let's get started on questions. Um, we've got someone monitoring your YouTube chat history. Um, and we'll start picking some of those up. I've already got one though, Sylvia. Um, where are women in lead tech positions? Where are they? Okay. <laughs> Well, you're here. That's good. <laughs> yeah, I am here. Um, I don't think that they're gone. I think that they weren't there in the first place. Um, Just never. Yeah. So I, I am in a lead tech field. And the way I got here is doing the work like everyone else. And I, I did experience challenges in that. Um, maybe that would be defeating to some people personally. It wasn't to me. If you are in a situation where you're being defeated at work, shrug it off because it doesn't change in the end. <laughs> and then eventually you'll get there. Um, but I think really what's most important is y you have to be involved in the first place. We need more people in the field. Yeah. And I'll, I'll, like I said, I'll disclose here. I have been, offered management positions before, but I have, I have declined them in preference of a, a tech position. And, and there, this was a big thing. And I don't know if it is still like the tech ladder versus the leadership ladder. Right. Yes. Yeah. So I feel like that's a good distinction to make. Like, I don't feel like you have to be in a lead position if you don't, if you don't want to be, um, maybe you could go tech ladder instead, but yeah. Yeah, so let's actually talk about that because that's that's not where I was coming from. So where are women in the uh, lead tech technical position? So you, you don't want to manage people. You don't want to deal with people. What you want to do is be really, really good at your field. Yeah. I don't mean to kind of promote here, Got but it. I am a representative for Linux Academy. And one of the great things that I really adore about Linux Academy is if you want to be in that lead technical position, we offer hands-on training that is based on real-world jobs. So if you have any doubts that you can't do something that you feel like you need to do, um, Linux Academy can take care of that and give you that confidence. Absolutely. Absolutely. I feel like if you're young and enthusiastic about things, oh, sorry, I use the word young. If you're just enthusiastic about technology and what you want to do next, there's no stopping you, especially with resources like Linux Academy, right? It's you can learn whatever you want to learn um, and, and walk through it and volunteer. Sometimes people don't want to be the lead tech, but sometimes they do, right? They want to like manage the project and make it, make it happen. Um, you can do it. There's a lot of tools out there to help. All right. So here's another one. Um, Sylvia, I'm a shy person. Do I need to be outspoken just to be in IT? <laughs> Um, I wish I could say that the answer is no. And I mean, honestly, the answer is no. You don't have to be outspoken to be in IT in general. But as a woman in technology, you're going to be well served to be able to, to express your opinion very strongly and probably very frequently. So you do have to repeat. And sometimes you have to find the right person to listen to you. So if you're not comfortable like speaking up during a meeting, what you can do is socialize that opinion either before or afterwards and say, hey, this is, this is something that I want to recommend. This is something that I would like to do. Can you, you know, hear me out and then let me know what you think and then go from there. A lot of times you win um, your perspective. I want to say you, you win, but you do. You get ahead. And you can win an argument or win a discussion or get to lead the project by socializing things beforehand. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I would just say you don't necessarily need to be outspoken, but you really do need to be involved in the conversation. Um, you, you need to be able to articulate what you're trying to accomplish and what your opinions are, even if they differ from someone else's. You do need to do that, even though you don't need to run down the hall screaming it. 
That's a good point. I was just picturing somebody running down the hall screaming it. <laughs> yeah. You know, I need to be heard now. You don't you don't have to say those things. Okay. Um, okay, well, uh, how can we work on building an inclusive environment right now today? And you did cover some of these in your um, presentation already. So how do we get started right now? Right now, I would go off and find a local meetup group and get involved. And I feel like a big part of that is, is not only participating as a student, but as a teacher. Um, my favorite way to learn anything is to teach it. And I think that's one of the reasons why I really love this industry and, and my job in particular, because I get to learn about a whole bunch of new technology right up front and then pass it on to somebody else, teach it on to the next person and have them implement it as part of their, their project. So today you can go to a meetup. Um, hopefully you have a lot of meetups in your area. I know we do in Denver, but I don't know how unusual that is. Um, we have meetups about everything um, and we have meetups probably about like every new technology out there. Um, and, and start reaching out to the, to the women in your community, bring somebody with you. Uh, or meet somebody there. Hopefully there's somebody there that you can meet, but if not, you can be a representative uh, and maybe you can invite some people that you know. The nice thing about those groups are you can come as you are, you can be yourself, you don't have to ask any, you don't have to ask questions, you don't have to do anything, you could just sit there and listen and kind of absorb it until you're ready to, to step in. Yeah, absolutely. And, and some of those meetups too, I know are available online at meetups.com or meetup.com. Um, in just a Google search or Facebook groups or, um, you know, those, those things will surface if you, if you put not a lot of effort into finding them, they'll come up. Um, and also I would say if you've had a good experience, share it, share it and attract more people to the pool because that, that kind of goes along with bring someone with you, just bring someone with you and, and you guys can set up, set forth on that together. The first step is going to be community and awareness. Yeah. Thanks for pointing out the fact that it is a it is an actual website, meetup.com. Yep. Yeah, yeah. You know, I forget that too, and and I don't want people to just um, we're assuming that everyone knows. <laughs> right. Right. Let's see if there's another one. Um, what is your favorite part of the job? I love a lot of aspects of my job. I think I always love. Um, well, I just said I, I love teaching other people about new technology. I think that's that's uh, amazing. Um, I get to do that, or I've had an opportunity to do that all over the world, which I also really enjoy. I enjoy the travel. I enjoy problem solving, um, even problem seeking. <laughs> Somebody, accused, one of my managers, accused me of that once. He's like, "I think you're not happy unless you're just in the middle of all the stuff happening." I'm like, "Yep, that's that's where I want to be." Um, so I, I, I like, I think I like everything. No, there's definitely some things I don't like, <laughs> but the best part that I like is technology, um, troubleshooting and the variety of the problems. Right. I agree. For me, it's, it's sort of that same thing. Um, I'm also, I feel very empowered, like I've empowered myself, um, to build whatever I want to do whatever I want. I can figure it out. Um, and I know that because I've figured a lot of stuff out already and that's kind of part of it. I feel yeah. like most of this job is just figuring it out. <laughs> the, the power of technology is amazing. I think you just touched on that, right? Like you can build all kinds of very, very uh, comprehensive systems that can literally reach out to the whole world. Um, you can fix problems that seem really daunting very quickly with technology, which is unbelievable. I mean, it really is amazing. And you can do it in so many different ways. You, there's no right. one way to do anything. There's no one way. And yet there, there's a right answer. You know what I mean? Like, like there's many right answers, which right. is nice. Yeah. And yeah, you know what? That's a great point. There are many right answers. So that goes back to it's important to be a part of the conversation because if Joe has an opinion and Caitlin has an opinion, they could both be the right opinion. But if they don't hear that opinion, they won't ever know. Exactly. Yep. yep. Okay. I think we got, I think we've got one more. Um, how do you promote inclusiveness in your own community? Okay. So I think I talked about that. I actually started 
started off with uh, becoming part of an organization. I started off as a student, right? So I became a student of Software Freedom School and I liked it so much uh, in terms of the inclusivity of it. Like even though the particular course that it, when I took it, when I started that, that particular, for that particular course, I was the only woman um, that I just decided to stick with it. And gradually we started doing this outreach to other women's groups. It's funny because just being the face, like just being there, just the fact that there's one female makes other females feel more at ease and more welcome. Um, so that's, yeah, that, that's kind of what, what I did. Um, <laughs> sort of kind of similar note, um, but separate. So diversity is really important, obviously. And some of those reasons why that's important is, you know, new perspectives for solving problems. Different people have different past experiences that they can use. Um, and, and we all know, we all took the training, um, diversity is important in the workplace, but as far as promoting inclusiveness in your own community, diversity is one of those things, but I also want to say, so is tolerance. So as a woman, you will experience bias, um, whether it's subtle or severe at some point, and it's important to just let that go so that you can make a difference. So just continue being tolerant of others and doing your own thing. If, if you're in a position to do so, ask others what their opinions are. So maybe there is another female or other minority even um, who you notice is not speaking up and they're not letting their opinion be heard. And those biases will not get changed um, until someone actually gets to know you and how your brain thinks and what your thoughts are. Um, so part of that is tolerance, but also speak up for others. Let them be heard if they aren't ready to speak up. Um, and it's, it's, it's as small as that. Just include others and don't hold grudges. And th that's the first step to making a difference. I love that. That's a really great message. We don't, we don't hear that enough. Sometimes you just get over it and keep going. Yep. Yeah. And, 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 you know, sometimes it can happen in such a small short span that now you're defeated you don't really want to be here anymore. You know, why do I wake up each day and do this and put up with this and no one appreciates me. And it's important to just put all of that aside because those are non issues in the long haul. I agree. And I, you know, I have been there. I've been there like fed up. Like I don't get any respect. This is not a good position. Let's try something else. And I did, I tried something else for, for about a year. Um, and then I came back. I'm like, I love this. <laughs> this is where I want to be. Forget, forget the, the um, forget what happened before. Let's just keep moving forward and and come back to to a career yeah. that I love. Yeah, you'll have a point where you say, you know what, I'm done. I'm I deserve to be here, and I'm going to be here. That's it. Period. All right. So I think that might be all of the questions. I'm just going to look through. If anybody has a question, you should just post it right now before I start closing. I'm thinking that's all of them. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and wrap up. And Sylvia, thank you so much for speaking with us and, you know, the talks that we've had beforehand and this, all of these issues that you've brought up in the PowerPoint, you're really providing your experience and your insights. Um, and I know that there are people out there who can really relate to a lot of the things that you've covered. Um, we'd love to hear from those people. If you're relating to sort of some of the things that we've talked about, we'd love to hear from you. If you want to reach out and share your own stories with us. Um, yeah, please do. We'd like to answer some questions afterwards too. That'd be, that'd yeah, be great to hear from you. Absolutely. Ask, uh, answer those questions afterwards and, and start a conversation about it. Um, it's Linux Academy's mission to support you and your mission to learn and grow. Uh, next month, we're going to be releasing, this is really exciting. Next month, we're going to be releasing over 150 new courses and hands-on content in the most relevant IT topics. So that's our biggest content launch in history. Um, so if you want to join in on that, you can visit linuxacademy.com live. And thank you so much for joining us.